Welcome to Dill's History Part 4, another part of my younger days and recollections of what I did and what the town was like when I was a youngster. We're going to talk about a few of the Dill streets today, the North End. Rolling back into those good old days of the 1950s and 60s, I'll try and give you an insight into the area we call North Dill, as I knew it when I was a youngster. Waking up on a Sunday morning, the sea running quietly along the shore, the odd birds singing and seagulls being their usual noisy self, at around 8am music could be heard drifting across the quiet airwaves from the distance. As it came closer, I could hear the drum beating and the people singing. After some 20 minutes, it would come to the bottom of my street, Brewer Street, where I lived at number 6. It was the Salvation Army, a regular occurrence on a Sunday morning. Some five minutes later, there would be a knock at the door. Father would open the door, and standing there would be a young lady dressed in her Salvation Army uniform with a collection box in her hand. The Salvation Army used to play around the streets in those days, every Sunday morning. In 1953, we had bad floods all around the East Coast. Dill never escaped, and you can see by the couple of pictures here how bad it was. I was only four years old then, but my father always told me that owing to the lack of fish during bad weather, he took a job working for the council, clearing the streets of Shingle. And as of always, back in those days, if you had no work, you had no money. There was no state benefit in those days, and father had a family to keep. This gives you a small insight into the water as it was in them days in 1953 when the floods took over Dill. This is the bottom of South Street, showing Lloyd's on the corner and looking up into the High Street. And we moved down to the north end, a bit further than where I'm going to talk, down into College Road, showing the paddle pump there, rescuing people out of their doors. For our journey, we are going to start at the top of Oak Street and slowly move north, looking at past times and the events that took place then. The Royal Hotel had on its north side a piece of garden then, laid to flowers and was looked after for a few years. But moving north from here, we passed many boats and well-known familiar faces. The Fascinator, Bert Tookies, Fido Bailey and his boats, Togo and Terry Harris, who had the Kirby and four brothers, along with a double sculler and a punt, and then Alec Marsh with his couple of boats, followed by Bob Abel's Blue Line, consisted of the Bridget, the Idy, the, the Diana. He added the Sail Wester, Ocean Gift, and Robin Marie when he restationed at the top of King Street. Next to him was Tommy and Harry Upton. I always remember the cod punt Little Dick. Another long story here. Next to here was the Skylark, then my father's Jim Scarden's boat, Mary Ann. Opposite Coppin Street was another of Togo Harris's boat. And from here north, the sea wall dropped away. At the top of Brewer Street stood Adelaide House Hotel, run then by Mr. and Mrs. Morphy. You could get a room here for the night for 17 and sixpence. No mean sum in them days. The promenade was rebuilt during this period and groins and the new sea wall put in. I think was, this was done by Barwicks. During their construction of this wall, the promenade collapsed in several places and beneath it was shown the remains of old houses which once stood there, all the cellars being exposed, with the long lost tunnels hiding behind piles of collapsed brick rubble. We used to venture into these on many occasions and got told off quite a lot until they finally put up a tall wire fence around it to stop us.
Every Guy Fawkes Day we would have a huge bonfire on the beach at the top of Copping Street, having collected rubbish for many weeks prior to November the 5th. There used to be several big bonfires on the beach in those days, from Dill Castle to Sandown Castle. It was always a challenge for us kids to see who could make the biggest. Some used to catch fire prior to November the 5th, although no one ever knew how it happened, but ours always ended up turning the biggest. A day in the 50s saw the weather really bad at Christmas time, with a constant easterly wind and freezing rain. I was still a young one then, but struggled against the wind and ice to get up to the beach one morning, and the tide was very low. There I found a mine embedded in the beach. We were always picking up hand grenades and bits, which were then taken to the police station and were put in a sealed box in their yard. But this mine turned out a bit more hazardous. Dad and I hooked this to the hand winch and pulled it up onto the promenade. The army were called in, and the seafront from Broad Street to Harold Road was sealed off. We had policemen in the house sheltered from the cold. They were supposed to be guarding the mine. It was bitter, but cutting a long story short, the bomb disposal squad removed it and blew it up in Sandwich Bay, and the explosion was enormous and heard for miles. Moving past the top of Coppin Street and the Three Compasses Inn, we come to the Dill Anglin headquarters. This is where Jock Kennedy resided, a good friend of my dad's. I can't remember who owned the club, but they had a boat built at Dill Marinecraft, and it was called the Silver Harvester. This was stationed at the top of Brewer Street and run by Nutty Revel. There's another story on this which I'll tell you about later on. Arriving at the covering seats, we turn and move down Ferry Street, with some of its cobbled footings still showing. On the right was Harry Upton's house. A bit further down on the left was the Dill Lugger Off Licence, where just about anything could be bought. I didn't spend much time in the street and it held no interest for us as youngsters. Turning left into Middle Street, we come to the cruise shop on the corner, run by Pat and her mother. She sold a variety of grocery items, tin foods and sliced meats. As kids, we used to come here and buy our sweets, blackjacks for a penny, wagon wheels, a penny eight the each, gobstoppers two for a penny, you don't see them like this today. Going south along Middle Street, we passed Bert, Bert Tookie's house up the steps. He was a boatman and had the fascinator on the beach opposite Star and Garter. Just past him was the two fat ladies as we called them. They sold second-hand furniture and home fittings, reasonable prices and quality goods. A few yards further, and on the right, we haul up to Barlow's shop. Again, another shop that sold everything. In those days, if you had credit from the shop and didn't pay by the time agreed, your name was posted in the shop window as a debtor. Leaving here and walking south, we come to Bob Abel's boat building yard, Dill Marine Craft. I spent many hours down here after school, then, on leaving school at 13 years old, went to work, work as an apprentice with him boat building. Timber was all sawn, planed and steamed in this yard, and on completion the boats were hauled up Coppin Street by many boatmen and launched opposite Brewer Street. In later years, we converted the net loft into a flat where Bob lived and his wife lived. Bob was also a Salvation Army bandsman and played the trombone. Moving into Coppin Street, we have Terry Frank's gun and tackle shop on the corner. Terry also sold fresh and frozen bait. You'd always find him in his cellar when you called in the shop. Coppin Street then was still mainly cobbled, and Terry Harris had a fixed wheel bike, and I had a pair of roller skates. We used to take turns in pulling each other along, one pedalling hard and one on the skates. A rackety experience going over a cobbled road at speed on roller skates, but it was good fun though. The Harris family lived at number seven on the left, Togo and his wife and sons. Togo had boats on the beach and his son Terry, who I hung around with, was a boatman like myself. Opposite Sir Togo Harris was the Buds, who had boats opposite the roundabout. One was the Princess Elizabeth. His son Billy took to the coasting trade and became a skipper, from which I should think now he has retired. His younger son Derek Budd was killed on the Jubilee Way on his motorbike just after the road opened. 
Opposite Johnny Bud's were another part of the Bud family. Next door to them was Tommy Upton's storehouse, later to be purchased by Bob Abel and turned into a posh living accommodation. And next to this is the Three Compasses pub, run when I was old enough to drink by Bill Brett. Father would send me along to the Three Compasses Inn on a Sunday lunchtime. Give me two shillings and a quart container, and I'd get him a quart of ale to go with his Sunday dinner. I was always permitted a small glass of this ale, and what a treat this was. As we turn right out of the top of Coppin Street, we make our way back past Adelaide House Hotel to Brewer Street. The Silver Harvester, built down Bob Abel's boatyard, was stationed at the top of Brewer Street and used for angling charter with skipper Johnny Revel, known as Nutty. The Silver Harvester was in an incident in the late 1950s when on a calm summer morning, Nutty was taking a crowd of Boy Scouts out on a trip. Being his usual self, and part the worse for wear on beer, which was his usual self, he ventured out with his Boy Scout cargo to the South Break Boy, where a coaster was at anchor. Apparently, he went alongside the coaster with his cargo of scouts aboard and purchased many bottles of contraband. On arriving ashore, the scouts were running up the beach shouting, We've been out with a real smuggler. Needless to say, the authorities were quickly on sight. The silver harvester was impounded and Nutty was arrested. We won't dwell on the subject of smuggling, but Nutty continued with his work as a boatman on Dill Beach and later run one of Bob Abel's boats. I continued as a youngster going out with him in the evenings, wintertime, herring fishing and sprat fishing, and learned a lot from this man. A bad landing. A couple of pictures coming up now show you a paddle punt coming ashore, one that had been hired out to a few anglers. In a heavy southwest well, they just timed it wrong, and this is what happens if things don't go right. We now turn back and move down Brewer Street, looking at Adelaide House on the right. This was run by Mr. and Mrs. Morphy when I was a youngster, and was a lovely place to stay. Next door to this is my old home, 6 Brewer Street, where our family ran their fish business. Number 5 Brewer Street also belonged to my grandfather. Mr Bill Bailey and his wife were given this property many years ago by my grandfather, another story which would take too long to pursue. At the rear of the properties was the herring hangs and stables. The stables were later converted to a shop for mother for selling fish and a large coal roof was installed here. The smoke rooms were kept and the fish were smoked by the hundreds of stones. Sawdust was supplied by Hogbin the log merchant with many, many lorry loads being delivered and loaded through the cellar flap into the cellar. Number six was refaced in 1880, hence the numbers on the wall in cement. Many years before my family acquired number six Brewer Street, it was a pub in which a man hung himself. Ghost could be heard frequently walking from the back gate around to the wash house and back again with a clip clop clip clop. The chap that died had a wooden leg, and many visitors wouldn't stay here after dark. The poultry that were reared down my father's farm was also prepared in number six Brewer Street and was well sought after by many people in the town, as you can see by the pictures here. In the cellar at number six was also a tunnel which went off towards Middle Street and according to my father joined others which went off in many directions. My mother also turned her hand to painting. Taking up the paintbrush and oil paints she did many pictures of boats and sceneries of the land and animals. Many of these were sold in the local library. She had her own shows and she's also shown in the Tate Gallery in London. You can see by the one or two pictures hanging on the wall here what kind of paintings she did and she became very famous in her own way. At regatta week when the fair came, father used to make toffee apples. These were very popular and were sold from the front window of the house in number 6 Brewer Street. A 
Apart from the fish that was cured and sold at my house, water was also supplied to Forest Funfair when it came to town. The galloping horses being positioned at the top of Brewer Street gave me many hours of fun, feeding the organ with music from which I never paid for a ride, and the last tune to be played on the organ at 11pm at night was the Teddy Bear's Picnic, my favourite. In the 1950s, my father, Jim Scarden, entered my little sister Linda into the carnival for a few years, taking first prize on every occasion. The floats were made from wood taken from the old fish boxes and the wire straps that bound them together. The framework for the floats being assembled in the stables on a pushchair. The thousands of flowers that made these floats were made by my mother from crepe paper, from which I used to sit and help unravel at night. These were glued with copy decks to the float. The carnival committee presented my sister Linda with a cup for winner of the first prize decorated perambulator 1955 to 1958. Floats were 1955 The Pearl in the Oyster, 1956 Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, 1957 The Last Rose of Summer, 1958 The Queen of the Channel, and 1959 The Wishing Well. I also went in as Come to the Cookhouse Door Boys, the great hit with the Marines that cheered me on. No more bull. Good old days, the atmosphere was lost when the fair moved to warmer. That's me pushing my sister Linda in the wishing well and the picture following is me and come to the cookhouse door boys. The shouts and cheers from the marines on that day is something I never ever forget. So obviously bully beef was something that the marines didn't like. These two floats here were done in the 1970s by my mother and my son Andrew Scarden. These were the last two carnival floats ever to be done by us and put into Dill Carnival. Opposite us lived Mr. Winstanley, and next to him was Mrs. Bothwick and her sister. Then there was a piece of derelict ground, once where there was a, a house which was bombed during the war. This was a shortcut to the alley and through to Oak Street. Later garages were built on the site. Then opposite that lived Mrs. Upton at number four. And I always remember her as she was posh and had a chauffeur car to run her around. Number three was home to the Willis brothers. They were bait diggers and supplied good quality yellowtails to anglers for fishing. They were Bill, Harry and Sid. And at number two lived the Moore sisters. We kept clear of these as they were scary. One of them looked like a witch, thin and pale and with long white hair. Dolad areas ran from here to the bottom of the street and were still in action when I was a youngster. Johnny Saunders, known as Joe Ninety, worked on the delivery lorries. He was a boatman as well, and ran one of Bob Abel's Blue Line boats in latter years. Again, I used to visit the dairy and was always given a bottle of milk with its cardboard top and cream head. It was delicious, unlike the watery milk sold today. At the bottom of Brewer Street on the left was Feed My Lambs, originally a soup kitchen, but in the 1950s was used by Stuart and Dunn's for developing films. Directly at the bottom of Brewer Street in Middle Street was old Johnny Rogers, another bait digger. And turning left out of Brewer Street into Middle Street, it gives way to Scarden's Fish and Chip Shop, owned and run by my uncle Bob and his wife Betty. My mother worked in the supper room in the evenings here, and I did many hours in my spare time, washing up for 10 shillings a week. We used to get cold fish and chips for a couple of pennies then, and they were lovely. Opposite the chip shop, where the car park now stands was an old mansion where we used to go and play. It had fruit trees in its grounds which made good scrumping. This building was pulled down and the nuclear shelter was buried here. The work being carried out by Leatherans. What happened to the shelter, one never knows, but the land seems to have fell fell of the council's requisition somehow. Now turning up Oak Street gives us more of the old character of Deal again which is long since lost. On the left was a piece of land where once a house stood, being bombed again during the war. 
On the opposite side stood Victor Edgington's building workshop, yard and buildings, adjoined a bit further along by Cavill's woodyard, where coffins and other items were made. I used to go along here every Saturday morning and bag up shavings and bring them back, back home. They were used for the chicken and rabbits on Dad's farm. But back in Oak Street, a bit further seaward was Cavill's ground where storage was had. At the bottom on the left, next to the bombed ruins, was Bob's garden's house. Next door to him, George's garden, who did a fish round. Moving seaward again, we come up on the left to E.B. Cavill's offices, where the businesses were run from. Next to this is the alley and then the Star and Garter pub. On the opposite corner of the Star and Garter was Old Dingerling's Cafe, a good haunt when we were playing truant from school. This now turns us back to the beach and looking north. A quaint old part of Deal it was then, when I was young and I lived at number 6 Brewer Street. Quickly going back along the north end of the beach by the Royal Hotel to Ferry Street. The skipjack lied to sail to Tommy Upton's hut, from which trips were offered during the summer before the war. During the war, scaffold poles and wires stretched the length of the foreshore to evade an invasion, with a couple of breaks to allow boats to be launched. One of Tommy Upton's boats, the Mini Haha, was bought by my father, James Scarden, in the late in the late 1950s. Taken down to his farm and completely rebuilt, she was then named the Fair Chance and stationed at the top of King Street with the Mary Ann and his other boat, the Fairway, previously Harry Beacon's Lady Beatty. Tommy Upton's boats were also Paddle Punt's Golden Warbler, the Tom, Kitty Wake, Ice of Bell, and the four sail mizzen punts, Fascinator, later owned by Bert Tookie, and the Kingfisher, the galley Seaman's Hope and Bluebell. Harry Upton had the punt Ethel and the cod punt Little Dick. Bill Bailey was situated a bit further south, opposite the Star and Garter pub, and lived in Five Brewer Street. He had the motorboat Irene, skippered by Frank Preston, also two paddle punts, one was the Jesse. In the 1950s, Bob Abel's boats, as I was previous said, graced the stage at the top of Brewer Street, with Johnny Nutty Revel, Joey Smith, Ernie Slack, myself, David Scarden as Beach Out, and old George Foy, known as Bubbles, as Winchman. These were used for angling parties, although in the winter months, sprats and herrings were pursued. As I mentioned, I used to travel net for Huss during the spring and summer. Well that's Deal in the Old Days, a quaint old town and unspoilt, with some quaint old characters which have never come back again, as now bureaucratic regulations and council control have taken away all that fun and the privileges we used to have. Hopefully this has given you an insight of what this part of Deal was like in the 1950s. We had a tough upbringing, worked hard as young'uns for our pennies, but we enjoyed life.